Come on, let's give God a hand praise and bless. If you've seen him work, come on, clap your hands and bless the name of the Lord. Is there anybody in the sanctuary and even online excited about what God is going to do for the rest of this year? I know y'all clapping at home, but I want to make sure we all right in the sanctuary. Anybody excited about what God's going to do for the rest of has anybody expectation level like real high and you got confidence in your God that no matter what you've been through up until this point, the best is yet to come? Can I just share with you that he's not done working it out on your behalf? I dare you just to look up and say, work it out, work it out, work it out, work it out. I want you to lift one of your hands in the sanctuary at home. Lift one of your hands. Y'all see the shirt I got on. God is, I'm confident that he's undefeated. Shameless plug. You can pick these up in the, in the lobby today. And because God is the greatest power, we shall never, never be defeated. And because God is the greatest power we shall never never be defeated I'm confident in that and because God is the greatest power we shall never never be defeated oh. And because God is the greatest power, we shall not. Y'all got that in your spirit real quick. Never be defeated. Come on, you the praise team now. Come on, say. And because, oh, that's it. It's the greatest. Sing it right there in your living room, right there in the kitchen, wherever you are. We shall not. If you're driving, keep your hand on the steering wheel, but sing, yeah. And because God is the greatest power, we shall never be defeated. One more time, and because God, come on church, is the greatest we shall never, never be defeated. One more time for the Holy Spirit. And because God yeah, is, we shall never, we shall never be defeated. That's the new way of saying it. The old way would say, tell me. back in the day. When we call on thy prayer, his name is precious Jesus. What? One more time. We're going to do it one more time. Oh, tell me who can stand me for us when call on that grave. Jesus, say it, precious. Jesus, we have Victory. Come on, say, I have the victory. I have the victory. 
That's a good place to give him glory. We got to This is the day the Lord has made. We are rejoicing. And I know we got to move, but if I can say one more thing, it would just to be encourage you. Victory belongs to We don't have time though. <laughs> Victory belongs to you. Victory belongs to you. And your whole row. Victory belongs to you. At home, no matter what you're facing with your bills, your finances, your health, your wealth. Victory belongs to you. Because God is undefeated. Victory belongs to you. He could never be defeated. Victory belongs to you, Jesus. And because I'm yours and you are mine, victory belongs to you. Sit down, get your Bibles. It is the day. Hey! It is the day the Lord has made. Come on. All right. It's Sunday morning. It's Sunday morning. We talked about the overflow last month, and this month we're talking about confidence. And when you got overflow coupled with confidence and the two marry each other, you should walk every day saying, Victory belongs to me. I don't care what the doctor say, you ought to say, Victory belongs to me. Even when your children don't want to act up, victory belongs. Never mind. When they want to act crazy on the job, victory belongs to me. Yeah, yeah. All right. Psalm 73. Give honor to our bishop, Pastor Kellen, today. Thank God for them. To all of our online viewers, God bless y'all for hanging out. All 70-something, 100 of y'all, thank y'all for hanging out. YouTube, Facebook, website. Come on, in the sanctuary, let's thank God for everybody hanging out today. EC Worldwide, EC Connect, God bless you all for joining us. And I thank God that he is the type of God that even though you may not be in the building, he's able to do for you where you are through this stream everything he's doing in the building. Isn't God uh, amazing? We saw the video earlier, right before uh, we began to talk about how undefeated God is. And uh, our series this month is Confidence. And we thank God for Pastor Daniel and the word he shared with us on last week. Amen. Can we thank God for him? Is that all right? And while we're at it, let's thank God for all of our serve team, our musicians, the, the minstrels, the psalmists, our AV, everybody making things happen, and all of our father's children. But the video you watch, and I know it was kind of quick, but it was an indicator of what it is to sometimes know you can do something, but doubt your ability to accomplish it. And on the end of that video, you saw how Brother Dwayne, he was going to try to jump those steps and got right there to the edge and kind of pulled up a little bit like, hold on. And there's sometimes in our life God is causing us or calling us to jump and we get right to the point of the moment where we're supposed to leap and we hold up a minute because uh, 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 I'm used to level ground. I'm used to, to walking in a certain plane. I don't, because when you jump, you got to trust God with the air underneath you. God help me. And as long as you got solid ground over you, there's a certain level of confidence you have in yourself and in your own feet. 
but when God causes you, hear me in the spirit, to leap, you got to trust the air that he has under you. It's almost like he tells them to step out, it tells Peter to step out on the water and Peter begins to walk. It wasn't so much that the water supported Peter, but it was the word under the water that supported Peter. And sometimes when God tells you to come, he's not telling you to rely on your circumstance. He's not telling you to rely on your situation. He's telling you to rely on the word he gave you. So today my prayer is that through the course of our time together, you will be encouraged in the word of death line. If you can't make a man think, you can't help him. So I want you to think today about where you are in your life, where you've been, where you want to be, where God wants to propel you into, and we're going to all get there together. We may not get there at the same time. Our processes will be different, but the outcome is still victory. So it don't matter if it take you a day and it take me two days. If it take you a week and it take me two weeks, I'm so glad that God will let me walk through my process and my outcome is still victory because God is undefeated. Psalm 73 says this, verse 1 through 4, if you will. I want to read the whole thing, but I, I'm going to read just 1 through 4, 1 through 3, whichever we feel. He says, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, verse 2, my feet were almost gone. And one interpretation said, I almost slipped. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Verse 4 says, for, they are, for there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. God, thank you for today. Thank you for this moment of confidence. Thank you for this month of confidence. Now, guard our ears, guard our hearts. God, let us open ourselves in the spirit to receive what you're saying to your church. In Jesus the Christ's name we pray, amen. Again, our series, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, for this month is confidence. But today, I want to deal with a particular word, and that word is not confidence, but it has to do with confidence, that without dealing with this word, uh, Daniel, you will never have confidence. And that is the word doubt. D-O-U-B-T. If you don't deal with the doubt, you will never be able to walk in confidence. So if I had to choose, and I know some of y'all are too saved in the sanctuary to admit some things, but I'm going to talk to some real folk today. Uh, as I know we got some real folk online that's watching, so I want to especially talk to them. But I just want to use, if I can, for a thought today. And, and you can take it any kind of way you want to. You may think it's a little controversial, whatever the case may be. And I I really don't care today. I just want you to grab it. And the thought for the day is, you know what? I almost slipped. <laughs> I almost <laughs> slipped. Now, you can take that a few ways. <laughs> when you stubbed your toe, I almost when you got that text message and you sent that long paragraph text back and you was ready to put sin and you're like, no, nah, okay. I almost slip when they wanted to say something to your face because they thought they was bad enough and big and bad enough and you was like let me tell you where you can go and you almost did it but you pulled I almost slip it's like your children thought they were grown for a couple of moments and a couple of seconds and they tried to buck up to you oh, oh bye and that uh, the anointing got in that backhand and you are uh, almost <laughs> I almost Slipped, But we're going to look from the account of Asaph today um, because in the Psalms it is easy to assume that the author of every part of the Psalms is David. But there are a couple of few accounts where the author is actually Asaph which happens to be the mentee of David. Asaph happens to be the worship leader. Y'all ain't going to talk right there. He happens to be the one who leads out in worship at a call. Well, he happens to be the one who, who has to lead the people in the worship. And we're going to talk about how Asaph deals with doubt today on the account of because all of us have had to deal with doubt. We are either having to face something or we will be faced with something. 
I remember uh, Bishop, you tell us, he said, keep on living. Just, just keep on living. He said, there's certain things you may not have gone through in your life, but if you just keep on living, some of you that are in these 30-somethings, go talk to some of the 50-somethings and, and let them explain. Talk to some of them 60-somethings and let them explain some stuff that's happened in their life. And you can be like, well, I ain't never went through that. Just tell them, keep on living. I, I, know, I know your baby right now is two years old and six months, and they real cute now, but that 13 and 15 age, is coming you just keep on living they cute now ain't saying nothing just crying and whining and they real cute ah oh, god because we live in a generation where we want the babies but don't want to take care of them but anyway but 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 they real cute now but wait till they get 10 and wait till they get 13 and wait till that little bitty bitty baby girl start filling out like she's 25 at the age of 15 and you're gonna say oh my there's some things now that i think i have to figure Oh, that young man, he, he, yeah, he a baby now, he little now, he's skinny now, then he get muscles. Mm -hmm. His mustache start growing in and he's still in the sixth grade and, and he start looking like he's 21. And when you go out to the restaurant with your baby, everybody think that's your man. Yeah, that, that one right there, there's, there's some stuff that it just comes with if you just live long enough. Have you ever been to the point where you find yourself struggling not with the right or wrong, not with whether you're a Democrat or Republican, not with whether uh, you like Pepsi or Coke, but struggling with what you have been taught and believe in your heart was the experiences in your life. You do what the Bible says, you are faithful, you uh, give your tithe, you read your Bible, come on church, uh, uh, and you pray, yet you find yourself struggling. You were so confident mm -hmm, that you heard from God. Mm -hmm. Couldn't tell you nothing. I heard from God. I know God said to move this way. I know God said to move that way. I know God said to marry them. Hello. I know God said to be with them. And then you come to find out that thing ain't quite what you thought it was going to be. But you know you felt like you heard from God. God told me that was my job. God told me that was my car. God told me that was my house until all the bills start coming in. God told me that was my car till you figure out that because you got that fancy car, now if one light go out, that's $2,000 right there just for the light. You was better off with a Honda. But at the end of the day, God told you everything you read in his word seems to confirm your plans in your life. You prayed about it every step along the way, always giving God glory. And, and then suddenly it seems like your plans literally blow up in your face. You try to carry on as though everything is fine. And we, we lift our hands still and we worship still, worship leaders and musicians. And we play and we, we guard the gates and we usher people to their seats. And we, we work on teams and we come in and we even smile behind the mask. And some of us, the greatest thing could have happened was the mask. So now I don't have to smile. Now I can act like I'm singing and I really ain't. But I dare you to find out in your mind that I don't let no mask stop. Nothing I got to do. I'll keep it on, but it won't shut me up. But you figured out that sometimes things just literally blow up in your face. You eat right, still got to deal with things in your body. You didn't get, get away with meat and you, you're vegan and you're vegetarian and you're meal planning and everything else and you're doing all this but weight still seem to come find you. If you look at something on the commercial, it seems like weight come looking for you. If you look at something, I it just seems like it just, but you're doing everything you can to keep it together. Then you turn on your TV, God forbid. And you see that wars are raging. And you know something is off. The way things are going in the world as, has you baffled. Black lives don't seem to matter at all. Uh, here we go. Crime is justified based upon the color of a person's skin. That if one culture does it or one skin color does it, it's a crime. But if another person does it, then it's okay. How in the world can you blow up a whole city and a whole community of people and it be all right? But you get mad when a, never mind, you get mad when a culture responds to the injustice that they've experienced. We're living in a world that is baffling to the mind of how in the world could things be the way they are. Then in the midst of all of that, you've noticed that your passion for God has started to dwindle. You are beginning to lose your desire to be in the word and to pray. You've become impatient 
cynical, if you will, hard to live with. And you just don't care much about the things of God anymore. If we tell the truth today. If you feel this way, then this is for you today. If you haven't felt this way, then as I said in the beginning, keep on living. You need to know today how to handle these situations. There was an old show on Martin. I know y'all don't watch TV shows like that because that's not really uh, 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 TVN and, 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 and the Word Network. But on Martin, there was a certain episode and they had to get this plumber. And they had the plumber and he was trying to ask how much it's going to cost to do this. And the plumber said, it may cost you a little. It may cost you a lot but it's gonna cost you. And there's sometimes in life, it may cost you a little. Mm -hmm. It may cost you a lot, but it's going to cost you. Understand this feeling doesn't mean that you have lost your salvation. Let me help somebody today. Just because you feel weary, just because you feel like hope is kind of leaving you, just because you feel like you're being depleted, just because you feel like your are capacity does not mean that you're not saved and that salvation has left you or however being tempted and you need to know how to fight against the temptation but even in your fight it does not mean you don't know God because sometimes we will let the things that we walk through, help me online viewers, tell us that we don't know God anymore, that God doesn't love us and we don't love him. No, boo-boo, that's not the case because I can love God and still not like where I am. I can love God and still sometimes, as the bishops say, have a flesh attack. This temptation, if, if not properly dealt with, can lead us to great sin, although it is not much as much as a sin in the flesh such as adultery, fornication, lust, homosexuality, drugs, and alcohol abuse. That's the stuff we like to talk about, but neither is it the stuff we quiet about, such as anger, covetedness, rebellion, unforgiveness, gossip, and even pride. Yet it is not properly, if it is not properly dealt with, it has the capacity and the capability of leading you into all things that are not proper for the development of your future. 2020 how was a year like unlike any other we've ever seen. Pandemic has changed the way we operate mm -hmm. all the way around. Even this morning at the airport on my way here, I promise you, and I didn't try to, it was just the way it happened. This man coughed. Now, 2018, somebody could have coughed and you didn't think nothing of it. Somebody sneezed and you like, God bless you. Now they sneeze and you like, God bless me. You're just trying to protect yourself. You don't know what's going on. It, it's the truth. Just tell the truth. This man coughed right when we get on the plane. I said, oh, no, hold on. Where are you sitting? I just need to know to make sure he's sitting somewhere else because I felt some kind of way. I felt unprotected. But there was a day I wouldn't have even worried about it. But this pandemic, God help us, has made us be conscious of things and made us be fearful of things we would not have normally been fearful about. The death toll has scared us. Over 200,000 people and counting have died behind it. The death toll is scary. What we thought to be normal, rather it was going out to eat or going to church as we see today has been changed. Racism and the blatant disregard for human decency seems to be at an all-time high. We wonder with ourselves, what in the world is going on? And how now can I have confidence in a God who allows all of this to happen? How you want me to be confident and you took my mama? How you want me to be confident and you took my dad? This is real talk. How you want me to be confident and I can't even deal with my own inner thoughts? How do you want me to be confident and I don't, I don't even feel like I need a praise break. I need more of some therapy and some help. And let me pause right there. There's nothing wrong with God and therapy. You can do both and that's a great recipe for your future. Yep, I just wanted to plug that. Get some help. Sometimes we often wonder why it is so hard to do right. Why is it so expensive to do right? <laughs> why is it cheaper to go to McDonald's than it is the health food store? Whole food, you go in, buy two things, you didn't spend $99. You go to, uh, go to McDonald's, you bought a whole meal for $1.99. I'm like, why is it so expensive 
just to do right, first natural, then spiritually. It seems like in this society that we live in, it's easier to do wrong. It's easier not to trust God. It's easier not to believe. It's easier to sling to your own understanding. And it's so expensive to trust him. It's so expensive to have confidence in him. It's so expensive to fall on your knees and pray because my rest is important. And sometimes I just don't have time because I'll never get my time back. And my time is so precious to me. It seems like it's expensive to do the right thing. The closer we try to get to Jesus, it seems like the more we suffer. You find yourself saying, my life has been so hard and painful already. I've had all I can take and I can't take anymore. As a minister of the gospel of Jesus the Christ, it is important for me in my viewpoint to help you think and understand the heart of God towards your life. I want to be able to give you today what God has given us through wisdom and knowledge. And again, knowledge is what you know. Wisdom coupled with knowledge, wisdom becomes the application of how you do what you know. Whether intellectual or emotional, having doubts of any kind can be scary and cause one to even question their salvation. However, the Bible contains many examples of people who doubt it. However, how we deal with the doubt is what's important. It's sometimes we want to think, well, I doubted God. You're not going to hell because you doubt it. What you have to do is learn how to deal with that doubt. Do I, do I, uh, yeah. You're not going to miss heaven because you had a doubt. He says, depart from me, you evildoer of iniquity, not because you had a doubt. Because there's many persons in the Bible who had doubts. Matter of fact, let me, let me make this clarification for you. There's a difference between unbelief and doubt. Unbelief is when people willfully set themselves against biblical teaching and the word of God. That they choose not to believe. That's what John 12, 37 says. But thou, he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believe not in him. Meaning that unbelief is when he is doing it right in front of you and you just choose not to see it. You choose not to believe it. That's different than doubt. Doubt is when people have an intellectual or emotional barrier to a more solid faith in the biblical teaching of the Lord. But they want to believe, but they just need some help to believe. It's not that you don't believe. Today the church is crying, help me believe. Men of standard said, help me with my unbelief. Trust in God. Mark chapter 19, 14 through 27 illustrates it when it says the father of the demonic boy possessed son looks to Jesus to the cure and him and he says to Jesus, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. The father acknowledges that though he has faith, he struggles with some doubts. Jesus still honored this man's faith and heals his son. Now you may say, well, Vaughn, how do you know the man dealt with doubt? Because earlier in that scripture, we understand that they they went to the disciples to be able to heal this boy and they could not do it. So they brought the boy to Jesus and then they saw and then, and then Jesus asked him, said, yeah, what's the problem with your son, man? He said, listen, every time that it seems like the demon is going, they throw him into the fire. They do this to him. They throw him on the ground trying to kill him. The essence of that, first of all, that hit me in my spirit was, is that the demons can try whatever they wanted to, but they never succeeded. The Bible said he had been dealing with this for a long time and the father Father said the enemy tries to kill him. The demons throw him into the fire trying to kill him, but he's still alive. The other part of that is when Jesus gets there, the man then says to Jesus, if you can. Here's the doubt. He says, I need, I'm bringing him to you in faith. But my doubt in me says, if you can. One translation, Jesus looks at the man and says, what do you mean, if? <laughs> if. I read it when you get home. Read the NIV. Read the Amplified Version and read the King James Version. Jesus said, if I can, have you ever, let me pause there for station identification. Have you ever had a time in your life that even in your prayers, you pray, Lord, if you're able, Lord, if you will. It's not a matter of if he's able. It's not a matter of if he will. My God can do anything. So he says this to the man. He says, what do you mean if? I can and after God after Jesus says to him all you have to do is believe and the man says I believe 
We have often been taught that you cannot have faith and doubt. When this, when this clearly shows the presence of doubt does not mean the absence of your faith. Because you had a moment of doubt does not mean the overall absence of your faith. What is important is what you do with how you handle the doubt moment. I believe in times of desperation, tragedy, death, seemingly unbearable circumstances that God understands our certain outbursts and doubt-filled questions. God, why did you allow this to happen to me? I've said it before, I'll say it again just for the, fake, uh, for the sake of uh, literally having a conversation with you. Some of us could literally pick about five people. We would rather they go through the circumstances we went through. We can pick about five people who need the situation we have because we feel like they would, they would uh, warrant better going through it than I would. I try to serve you. At least they don't even do what they're supposed to do. Well, I got to face financial difficulty and they don't even sow seed or give time or give offering. But it's sometimes the enemy will want us to look at everybody else in the midst of their life and then make that our measuring step to understand and ask questions why have you done this to me even Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross cried out like this in doubt for a moment I can say uh, affectionately and spiritually and with my imagination my God my God I'm your dude I'm only here to get them back to you but why have you forsaken me have you ever felt in your life that you know you're God's favorite, that you know you're called, that you know you're chosen, but you still sometimes in your room ask God, why have you forsaken me? Have some of you ever been in a place online where you feel like, God, you've left me out here to dry? You've let everything I've tried to work for fall apart? You've let everything I've tried to trust you for seem like it's going down the drain? But why did you choose me? Jesus is overwhelmed here in this garden. He's overwhelmed in the garden. He gets to the cross. He's overwhelmed and he's saying, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he could have at that moment got off the cross and been done with it. But instead, he allowed the Spirit of God on the inside of him to console him. Pause there for, uh, for a moment. Sometimes, even in your roughest, most maddest, most angriest, most upset, most wanting to cuss moments you've ever had, you got to pause and depend on the Holy Spirit on the inside of you and say, I need you to comfort me. I need you to comfort me because if you don't comfort me, I'm about to lose it. You know what? Let's take a little moment right here. I think some of us just need to take a moment today and admit the fact that you almost lost it. Oh, come here, Kirk Carr. He said, I almost let go. There were times when I felt like I couldn't take no more. I couldn't deal with no more. I was ready to give up on me. I was ready to give up on life. I was ready to give up on church. I was ready to give up on my ministry. I was ready to give up on my call because I figured I might as well be better off without none of y'all because I'm tired of life. Sometimes when life happens, it happens in a negative way to great positive people. In the most trying hour, he turned his life future over to the Father's hands, Jesus did on the cross. He says, I'm in all of this pain, God help me, and I know death is inevitable, but I know in order to make it through this, I've got to turn myself over to you. I know I'm dying for them, but ultimately it's for you. God help me. And I'm dying for them so you can have what you always wanted from them, which is that one-on-one -on -one relationship. Because I don't want them no more to have to go through somebody else to get to you. I don't want them to have to wait for somebody to pray for them. I want them to be able to intercede for their own self. I want them to be able to pray for their own self. I want them to be able to worship for their own self. You are in a place, God, thank you, Holy Ghost, because of the price that Jesus paid and how he allowed himself to be back with the Father and he gave himself over what he did was was saying when you feel like nails are in your hand when you feel like nails are in your feet when you feel like you've been pissed in your side when you feel like there's 39 lashes on your back when you feel like don't nobody like you when you feel like the same folk that cried Hosanna and holy is him is the same folk that said crucify him when you feel like that all you gotta do is turn who you are over into him and if you can just place yourself I feel grace here. In the hands of the master, everything will, uh, it'll be all, calm down, Vaughn, all right. It'll be all right. Uh, he 
says, into your hands, we got to move. I got a few moments. I commit my spirit. And having thus said, this is Luke's account, he gave up the ghost. What ghost you holding on to? You want to get over this doubt? Give up the ghost. You want to get over this pain? Give up the ghost. Give up your worry. Give up your understanding. Give up your ability trying to figure it out and let him do what only he can do. Let's move quickly. In Psalm 73, let me give you the key to crisis. Hmm. Deals with the man named Asaph and he said, my foot almost, here we are, slipped. Or rather correctly, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Asaph's account is dealing with the temptation of doubt. Understand, Asaph again is a Levite. He's the leader of the worship team. He's the leader, Sister Tommy, of the praise team. He's the one, Mina, that was out there singing and leading. They beyond folk and Mother Shooty and leading the folk in praise and leading them in worship. You mean to tell me Despite his calling, his position, his, his, I'm going to try to help somebody because y'all, y'all, <laughs> y'all, y'all thought that the calling was cute. You thought positions were powerful. Uh-uh. Uh, uh, the greater your call, the more you got to go through. The, the greater position you walk in, the more turmoil you have to go through. Because I know they won't say it, but let me testify for, some, for my own self. Some of your most gifted people are the ones who go through the most torment. Some of your most anointed people are the ones who go through the most torment. So before, I'm going to help somebody online. Before you want somebody's anointed, you better gauge what they had to go through to get it. Before you want to preach like somebody else, you better gauge what they had to go through to preach like that and what they're currently going through and what's being squeezed out of them. Before you want to sing or play or do something like somebody else, you better measure up everything they've had to walk through just to get to where they are today. Because sometimes the stage look good but the back room will tear you up. Look at folk on social media and look at them and you can look at people in their relationships and say they have the perfect marriage and they do on social media. They got the perfect family and they do when they come to church. But if you were to follow them back home and y'all don't want to tell the truth and they're going to tell the truth online because can't nobody hear them when they do. They at home talking about that's right because ain't nobody hear them but them. But at the end of the day when they at home they're struggling through things. When they're at home they're having to fight through certain situations and uh, dynamics and proclivities and we don't see that part and sometimes we'll judge somebody by the outward appearance of what we feel like we have when what they have and we really don't know what they're working through see people smile but don't know the pain that's racking their body you'll see them lift their hands but you don't know how much it hurts in their shoulders to be able to lift their hand and there's some folk even when they stand up God help me in here the whole point of them standing up is a miracle because if it was up to them they'd have to sit down because the pain is so strong but they say God I will enter your gates God help me with thanksgiving that's why some of y'all couldn't wait for the church to open not because you depended on the walls not because you depended on a building but you just want to get around some folk that when you had doubt in their faith will help strengthen you. This thing ain't about just getting back in the building. It ain't about just coming to church to have church. It's about the ability that I've been isolated long enough. Now I need to draw some strength that when I can't pray, I know there's somebody on my road that'll pray for me. When I can't sing, there's somebody who will sing for me. When I don't believe, there's somebody who will say, but I believe for you. Oh, let me talk for it real good for a moment. I know my time is almost up. That's the benefit of the small groups is when you get weak, somebody else can help build you up. When you feel like, oh, hope is gone, that's why I'm going to put a plug here. You need to get connected today. Don't you wait another week. You don't have to do life by yourself. At the end of the day, there's somebody that's walking through what you're walking through and there's somebody who's already come out of what you're walking through and you need each other. You better get plugged. Hope that don't sound mean, but you better get plugged. Because what's to come is worse than what's been. 
and you need to have some folk on your team. Come here, LeBron. You got to have some folk on your team that when you can't score, they will. You need to have some folk on your team that when you don't know what the play is, they'll run it for you. You need to have some folk on your team that when a hallelujah won't come out, they'll say, but God, you're worthy for you. You need some folk on your, is there anybody in here? Anybody, I feel like grace on me today. Is there anybody in the balcony online that can say, I need somebody, I need. I know you say, I don't need nobody. I don't need none of y'all, but you need somebody that when you are weak, they will help you become strong. All right. Now, Asaph, we out of time. Asaph, he's he's accredited for writing 11 of the Psalms called the Psalms of Asaph. Yet despite his calling, he's tempted with doubt. Now we know Asaph was a pure hearted man. He had the right concept of God. And the first verse he says, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of the clean heart. Yet in the very next text, verse, his, this Levite, this man of God, uh-huh, this member of the praise team, oh God, says, Although he's good to Israel, Dr. Kozar, I still almost, I, I almost, I know God you're good all the time, all the time. God is good. How you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored, but I still almost. The thing I like about Asaph is not the fact that he almost slipped, is that the fact that he told the truth. So when you tell the truth, you admit what the inevitable is and you allow yourself to get the help that's needed. And I like the fact that now Asaph told the truth because now the truth becomes his testimony. Come here, church. And we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the words of our testimony. So because Asaph told the truth, I can have victory today. Because I can know I can be called, I can be chosen, I can be working in ministry, I can be leading in worship, but I still have moments that I say I almost... If anybody know anything about the, it should be y'all. Let that November and that October roll around and that snow get to hitting and that ice get to hitting and you think you're going to walk right out that little store, out that job, and you hit that ice that you couldn't see and you almost. Some of y'all shorter people, you don't have a long way to go, but some of us tall ones, when you slip, that's a long way to fall. So there's a sense of, hey, go that by. There's a sense of mind issues, you would think. Because verse one, you're great to Israel. Verse two, but I almost slipped. It kind of goes with he understands he can be honest because his mentor was. Because the Psalms are full of David's honesty. I will bless the Lord at all times. And another, another part says, and I will, listen, I want to tear him up. God, avenge me of my adversary. Avenge me of my enemies. He said, and he's going back and forth between giving God glory but telling God his issue. Giving God glory but saying, God, if you don't handle this, I'm not going to be no good. He's giving God worship but at the same time, he's having his moments that he gives up his. Uh, why does Asa feel this way? He feels like he wants to let go. Why does he make such a statement as this? Because Asaph is going through some stuff and he feels that at this point in his relationship with God, why is he struggling so if I'm yours? He sings. He does his responsibilities. He, he does his work in the tabernacle. Yet in verse 14, for all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. The Hebrew meaning of the word play and chasing is this, I have been stricken violently with trouble. He says every day, Elder Starks is something else. He's almost saying, Sister Stacy, if it ain't one thing, it's another. If it ain't this, it's that. If it ain't that, it's this. If it ain't the kids, it's the husband. If it ain't the husband, it's the wife. If it ain't the job, it's your entrepreneurship. If it ain't this, it's always something. Come to church and sometimes it feel like 
Same folk who smiled at you last week won't even smile this week. And you can tell them they still got on the mask and you still know they ain't smiling. You can look at the way their eyes is. Because when you smile, your eyes go this way. Pay attention to people. You ain't got, I know you can't see their mouth, but watch their eyes. If their eyes go up like this, they smiling. If they go like this, that means they looking at you crazy. I'm trying to help somebody. Uh, but but, but you say, how is it that you flipped up on me? I know I, I'm going to talk to about 10 people in the sanctuary, about 20 people online. You will feel like even the closest people to you have flipped script on you. We were supposed to be besties for life. Now you can't stand each other. Never mind. Okay, never mind. He says, every morning I wake up, I got to move. I'm touched with sorrow and I'm touched with pain and I'm touched with grief. Every day I'm being beaten down. I feel I'm, I'm being punished. It's too painful to even. This is what he says in verse 14 and 16. Through six, it's too painful to even talk about. Asaph states in verse 3 though, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. As Asaph looked around him, all he saw was wicked people prospering with great wealth. Ah, uh, God help me. People who apparently live without pain, enjoying the high life, living, living their best life. They were living in the lap of luxury with an abundance of material blessings, having all they could ever want or need. The pure-hearted, dedicated, church-going man or woman of God was being tempted by the devil on every end and seemed like they just come here to movie life. They just can't get right. They got everything, houses and cars and lands, and I'm serving you and I can't get one thing right. Doubt begins to creep in. And if you were a person, if we tell the truth, and you ever, all of us did, so I'm just saying ever, so you can like kind of just ease yourself into it. If you ever was in the world any kind of way, then if you start gauging things, you'll start gauging the fact, and I said fact, that sometimes you feel like you had it better. When it comes to friends, when it comes to family, have you ever noticed that when you was going to the club, you had no problem with getting folk to hang out with you? Uh, Y'all ain't gonna talk in here. But you wanna read your Bible, now you can't find no friends. When you wanted to go out and do your thug thizzle, you had no problem with folk hanging with you. But now you wanna do things the right way, you can't find no friends. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me in here. When you had money, you always kept money because you always kept buying drinks for everybody. But now you can't even afford a Coke and a smile. Have you ever felt like that I had it better when I was out there and now that I'm in the kingdom it seems like it's one struggle after a struggle it's a suffering after a suffering but can I tell you something that most of the time what you see that's glamorous in their life they deal with issues at home and most people that you look at and you gaze that they got it all together they really don't have it all together like you think they do and let me talk to my online church let me talk to my millennials and my young adults y'all better Better quit getting my young people y'all better quit getting caught up by what social media look like and trying to match your life up to somebody you saw on social media they got hair that ain't theirs and you trying to make yours like theirs just go buy it don't take yourself through no stress they got bodies that ain't even theirs y'all ain't gonna talk to me you think it's natural no that's an add-on but at the end of the day you trying to be somebody that don't even know who they are and when you become them and then they figure out who they are, you won't even want to be them no more. So you're better off being yourself. What do you mean by I'm saying this? Be okay with whatever happened in your past. Speak into your now and propel yourself into your future. You don't have time, God help me, to let doubt creep into the place where you begin to dwell on it. Even when it kicks in, I feel a grace here. You got to tell doubt you can't live here. You had your time. You had your moment. I had my flesh attack and I almost but I didn't I almost but I didn't because I can almost slip but as long as I don't hit my head I'm okay my slip ain't gonna kill me kill me but the head damage me I, I, I gotta go but I hope I was preaching to some real folk it ain't about no fake church we after 2020 we shouldn't be doing nothing fake no more after 2020 we should even be considered fake people no more after all the hell that you had to go through you ought to tell the devil hell no after all the hell you had to go through to get where you are after everything God has done for you and brought 
you through and you're going to be fake mountain. No, I'm going to wear every scar. I'm going to wear every issue. I'm going to wear this pain because I'm giving it to the Lord. Say amen, somebody. So even when I got to go through, I won't get mad. Even when I got to deal with things, I won't get mad because greater is he. Hey, what I say that is in me than he that is in the world. Say amen, somebody. All right. Second Timothy chapter 2, we're closing here. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Psalm 73 and 13 says, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. Asaph was so confused by his suffering in comparison to the easy life of the wicked, he nearly slipped into unbelief. <laughs> he didn't slip and steal no money. He didn't slip and go out and do nothing he had no business doing. Asaph says, I almost slipped into un. <laughs> when I said I almost slipped, some of y'all, we took it there, I almost slipped when I said something. I almost slipped when I did something. But what about the time where you almost slip into unbelief? You almost slip into the place where you don't trust God to be who he is. And we've heard over and over that you got to trust him for everything and doubt him for nothing. We've heard over and over and over that you got to keep your ear close to the mouth of God. We've heard over and over these declarations and these decrees. And if you're not careful, you will almost slip. Not into sin, but into unbelief. Because the devil knows he can't make you turn your back on God. He just want to make you not believe. He wants you to believe God can do it for everybody else, but he don't want you to believe God can do it for you. He, he wants you to believe everybody else's family can be all right, but he don't want you to believe your babies can be all right. He wants you to believe that everybody else can have a boo and a bay, but you can't have a boo and a bay. Come here, church. He wants you to believe you can't have what you believe that God said is yours. Yeah, but Thomas Whitfield said back in the day, if you could just hold on and wait just a little while, yeah, uh, uh, he, was, he was ready to throw in the towel. Give up, many, uh, give up immediately. The temptation of doubt had him thinking, I have been doing right and enduring our hardship all this time for nothing. All my strictness in spirit life, all of my diligence in my natural life, my praising, my worshiping, my studying of God's word is, has been useless. I've done like I was supposed to do, yet I continue to suffer. <laughs> he asked, what's the use of going on? When you are tempted with doubt, when a trial comes upon you, when you are grieving and dealing with the everyday struggles in life, you need to guard your heart against slipping into unbelief. Listen here, you are... <laughs> Even if, I'm going to say this and I'm going to get in trouble, uh, uh, even if your mouth slip, don't let your belief slip. Y'all know because you say stuff all the time you don't mean. You know in that text message, you typed in there and said LOL and never laughed. <laughs> Lying. LOL, sin, you never laugh. I'm praying for you and you never pray. That's what we don't, <laughs> there's sometimes we say stuff that we don't match up. So even if your mouth slips, don't let your belief slip. Because that's when Satan came along bringing lies. See what you get for serving God? See what you get for believing in the first place? He lets you become confused about his voice and gives you fake guidance. Satan, he lets you hear voices and see words from scriptures and then when you're finally ready to move in, he abandons you. Hmm. He leads you on and then drops you off. Some of us are leaving out byproducts of our decisions dropping us off. It's amazing to us that our decisions weren't as committed to us as we are to them. Hmm. That's for the thinker. It's amazing that we were not, that our decisions were not as committed to us as we were committed to them. There are some decisions we made mm, and we thought through it real good. 
But after you made, after we made our decision, our decisions didn't remain faithful to us. Psalm 73, 16, 17, y'all say, it says, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Here we are, we're closing. Then understood I therein, Asaph said, I'm not giving up. I'm going to the sanctuary because there's something about a sanctuary that has my answer. He said, Y'all, y'all know, he says, I'm going into the sanctuary. The psalm said, he who dwelleth in the secret place of the most high God shall abide under the shadow of the earth. That's the sanctuary. That's why 2020, if you learn anything, you should have been how to create a sanctuary. You, you should have this right in your bedroom. You should have this right in your front room. You should have this right in your dining room. There should be some kind of sanctuary. So when you come in the corporate sanctuary it's nothing new. I'm only doing what I already was doing because I've already learned how to create. Asaph said I found my answer in the sanctuary. Holy Spirit spoke to Asaph in verse 17 and the answer that came aloud and clear. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. Asaph realized I'm not the one who's slipping. The wicked are the ones who's slipping. I ain't the one who's really tripping out. It's the wicked. That's why they sung a hymn back in the day. Say my hope is built. God help me here. On nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean to own Christ the son and all oh, rock I stand while all of the ground that means that what you're on is slippery but what I'm on is solid what your own may be seeking like quick said but the word of God the tabernacle of God the glory of God will always be a firm foundation that's why your families have been able to build from generations to generation that's why the faith can't be weakened that's why the trust in God because there was somebody who said on Christ you see only here because somebody said on Christ so Asaph had to turn his doubt into joy he got in the presence of the Lord one two he changed his focus he says in Psalms 121 I will lift up my eyes to the hills from which cometh my help, my help cometh from the Lord which made the heaven and earth. Take your eyes off of other people and focus. Israel said, I realize where my help comes from. He began to pray. Philippians 4 and 6, 7 says, be careful for nothing but in everything through uh, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be known unto God and the peace of God which surpasseth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He decided to stand on truth. He says in John 17, 17 says, your word is truth. And then Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith is the opposite of debt, debt, doubt. Therefore, the way to get rid of doubt emotionally or intellectually is to replace the doubt with the truth of God. And the truth is you are more than a conqueror. I used to sing a song back in the day. I know y'all may not know this, but it said, this joy I have. The world, if I was about to have a Baptist fit, I'd have it right now. The world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Is there anybody that understands I've dealt with doubt, but I got some joy? And you know, that's where we get excited when we say weeping may endure for a night. The alternative word is may. That means it doesn't have to. It's just an option. So I choose that even when it's dark, I'm going to still have my joy. People say, why you always say good morning no matter what time of day it is? Because it's always morning for me. And after all the stuff I got to walk through, I got to keep declaring that it's my morning. No matter what it looks like, it could be six o'clock at night I'm gonna say good morning it could be eight o'clock at night I'm gonna say good morning because I have to speak in my life what I want to see and until what I speak I see I'm gonna keep speaking it you gotta make up in your mind that this joy I have the way you come back doubt bro Bootsy is with the joy of the Lord like Bootsy be doing when he be rapping and stuff and he be up there dancing. It's the joy, devil. Get off me, devil. It's the joy of the Lord. 
And that's the attitude you got to have when he comes in your home. Get off me, devil. When he tries to come on your children. I felt that, Bootsy. Get off me, devil. When he tries to work on your mind. Get off me, devil. And you got to make sure that you're always speaking that which puts you in the freedom. Let me get this to you because this is 7th Street knowledge right here. African American Heritage Hymn, hymn, hymn number 502 says this. Come let us sing. Let us rejoice. Come let us sing. Let us rejoice. Messiah's come. And he brought life. And he brought laughter into my soul. It would say verse 2 says it would have been enough if he brought life. It would have been enough if he brought peace. It would have been enough if he brought joy. But he brought laughter into the other day I put on Facebook and Instagram sometimes you just got to laugh out loud I don't care you've already I feel a preach but I'm not gonna do it you've already cried out loud you've already been ashamed out loud you've already wept out loud you've already complained out loud God is bringing you into a place of because he's removing you out of your doubt moment and he's giving you the confidence you need that you're about to laugh out loud I declare and I decree and I prophesy to everybody in the building and online that this week you're going to laugh more than you've laughed all year. I pray oh Lord, that God will give you something to laugh about. I pray that the thing that made you used to cry, you'll laugh in the face of the devil. Somebody just give him a laugh. Give him a laugh. Give him a laugh. You've cried long enough. It's time to laugh. I know he's all right. Laugh. This is your week to laugh. There's a confidence God is building in you this month. This is going to be a month of laughter. Uh, you ain't crying no me. <laughs> oh, you tried it. Y'all know how you get mad? Oh, God. And hey, you get mad at other people and be like, you tried it. You're going to tell the devil that you tried it, but ha, ha, ha. Because the third part of the song says, ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 ha. Now, I thought they made that up when I was growing up. I thought my dad that made that up. I said, that ain't no real song. But in the hymnal, the third verse says, ha, 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 ha. Messiah's come and he brought life and he brought laughter into my soul. So if you don't remember no other verse, at least remember verse three. And when it gets heavy this week, say ha. Ha, 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 ha. When your body's rocking with pain, say verse 3. Ha, 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 ha. When your children seem like they don't want to do right, say ha, 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 ha. I thought they made that thing up. That's an actual hymn. Ha, 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 ha. Ha 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 Oh Ha 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 And then he brought laughter into my soul I dare you to clap your hands right there I'm about to laugh my way to victory I'm about to laugh my way to joy I'm about to laugh my way into the next season of my life Is there anybody in here that can lift your hands and say, I'm ready to laugh. I'm ready to laugh. Doubt can't hold me because I got a ha, 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 ha. For my churchy folk, ain't the Lord all right? Yeah, that's all right. There it is. In conclusion, you got to make up your mind. Stand to your feet. Here we are. You got to make up your mind that you will not conclude the rest of this year with doubt in your heart hear me 
I'm not talking about doubt showing up. I'm talking about you entertaining it. Because it's going to show up. One scripture said, matter of fact, trouble is going to show up because a man is born of a woman. <laughs> it's only here of a few days and all those days are full of trouble. So you're going to have to, but you cannot live there. Stop making permanent residence in things you're supposed to pass through. You didn't set up camp and you weren't even supposed to be there for nothing but an hour. Don't turn four days into 40 years. Doubt is not your life. It was a moment in your life. Failure is not your life. It was a moment in your life. Disappointment is not your life. It was a moment in your life. You've got to make up in your mind, I will not live in those moments. But there's a victory that belongs to me. And one of the things that make a person who don't like you mad is when they see you laugh in the face of everything they do. You tried it. My marriage, you tried it. My family, you tried it. My self-esteem, you tried it. My children, you tried it. My finances, you tried it. My business, yeah, you tried it. But I still got a ha, 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 ha in my spirit. Father God, thank you that we walk in confidence. And we thank you that you kept us so we wouldn't let go. I almost let go. I almost threw in the towel. I almost gave up, but I thank you that you kept me. I thank you that you kept me through danger seen and unseen. I should have lost my mind, but you kept me. My health should have been fleeting from me even now, but you kept me. My past should have caught up with me by now, but you kept me. And for this we're grateful. And for this we honor you. In your son Jesus the Christ's name. Amen. Celebrate God here. In the sanctuary for those, somebody may be here that does not know the Lord is your personal savior. I want you just to lift your hand where you are. So I wouldn't let go. God kept me. So I wouldn't let go. Oh, God kept me. So I wouldn't let go. So I wouldn't one more time. God kept me so I would lay. Father, I cover these in your name, in your blood. That there's somebody today that does not know you as their personal Savior, that they will confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that you are their Savior, that they will denounce sin, that they will believe that Christ, you came to earth, born of a virgin. You came to redeem us to the Father. We denounce sin today. We denounce Satan today. And we, got, we say, God, we want Jesus to come fill our hearts. We want the Spirit of God to come fill us. And we open ourselves today for your Spirit to do just that. And we declare that we are saved. And God, even for some of us that already proclaimed it, we say it again just for the sake of letting the enemy know that we're saved today. I almost slipped, but I'm still saved. I almost messed up, but I'm still saved. I want you to take a moment in the name of Jesus and I want you to put your hands together in the sanctuary and bless the name of the Lord.